My message tonight, the keynote address of this International Women's Conference, Woman, Women Witnesses, World Changers. You want to be a woman witness? If you will be, you will be a world changer. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the 8th chapter of Luke. Women, be sensitive to the Lord tonight. You're here out of an, because you have an appointment with destiny. You're not ordinary people that are here tonight. God has you here for His divine purpose. Not for the satisfying of any human person, but for an appointment with God. Are you sensitive to that? Be sensitive to that. And then I want to say, women, when you read the Scriptures, listen with a deeper voice than the theologians have spoken. Listen for yourself. Listen with your spirit. These verses are so simple, but you're going to hear a message tonight. Chapter 8, the Gospel of Luke, beginning with the first verse. I'm just going to read about four verses there. Now, it came to pass afterward that Jesus went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him. Now, let's keep reading, women. And certain women, everybody say that. And certain women, you are the certain women tonight, who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna and many others. Everybody say, many others. Many others. That many others was referring to whom? Women. Say it again. Yeah. Women and many others. You know any woman that goes anywhere, you don't go alone, Margaret. When women go, many women go. You open the door and let one woman in the pulpit. Look at pulpits. Here come the women. I'm telling you. We got a pastor right here. 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 And they're all what? That sacred word. After God had polished all of his creative ability, he did her. That's right. He looked at Adam and says, oh, I can beat that. Rolled up his sleeves and went back to work. <laughs> Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod Stewart, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from what? Their substance. Hey, listen, uh, before I go on to my next verses, I got to stop and talk about these women because these women were not lowly fishermen. <laughs> Come on. The women were not lowly fishermen. The women were women of importance, of leadership, and of wealth and knowledge. Come on, ladies. He had to choose lowly fishermen because all the hierarchy were too proud. But the women, he could go for the, those of importance, like you. Okay, here's Mary of Magdala. Probably a woman of wealth, according to many commentators, she was a wealthy woman. Do you women have anything against wealth? Well, I've been poor. I don't recommend it. <laughs> Number two, Joanna, wife of the steward or the treasurer of Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee, a woman of the higher social caste. Come on. Not so lowly. Number three, Susanna. We only know her name, but probably, according to commentators, she was a woman of means. 
I want you women to shift gears. Don't think poor. Think prosperous. Amen. Don't think gimme. Think give you. Contributing. Having money. Having the power that you need to make a difference in all the things we need to make a difference in. Number four, Mary, the Lord's own mother. Was she a woman of destiny? Was she a lowly fisherman? She comes from a very high family. Number five, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, described also as the mother of James and Joseph, James the apostle and his younger brother. Salome, wife of Zebedee, mother of James and John, a sister of Jesus' mother, and many others. Now turn with me over to the 20th chapter of John. I'm going to give you enough tonight to really saturate you. And now we go into the message. Women witnesses, world changers. Beginning with the 11th verse. Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, What? Mary. You know he knows your name. I'm not going to divert because I've got a heavy message. I'm going to force myself to these scriptures. Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling. Get rid of that word touch. What theologians tell you about that word is wrong. Don't cling to me. No, it was wrong, not wrong for her to touch you. Don't cling. Don't hang on to me. Don't cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Everybody say, praise God. Praise God. Now, fasten your seat belt. There are many questions raised by these scriptures. Some of those are the most significant, some of these are the most significant moments in the history of the Christian church. And a woman is at the center. Why? Was this an important time? Was this an important incident? Was what Jesus said at that moment important? See, check every detail because you've heard this story again and again don't go over it quickly because your future your past your present is all wrapped up in it why was it given to a woman this message one of the most important messages that could be given was given to a woman first everybody say first a woman was the first to preach the greatest message of our Christian faith. So if women are useless, if women are to be silent, if women are to be subdued, why was Jesus leading off giving this important message to Mary? And why did Jesus personally commission a woman to preach to his 11 hand-picked, personally tutored apostles. <laughs> Men, Jews, apostles. Pretty elite crowd. I mean, you and I don't have to have it that elite, do we? 
Why was the first preacher of the resurrection a woman? Hey, ladies, she was single. I always have single women ask me, do, you, do I have to get married to get in the ministry? I say, for goodness sakes, find out what your call is and get busy doing it before you get married because God's got a companion for you in ministry. If you marry too soon, you may not get hooked up with the right one. And what God has joined together is what really works. Why was Jesus' first appearance to women? Just ask these questions. Why were there only women at the tomb? Everybody say it. Where were the men? Where were the men? You've heard a statement lately. Where was George? Where was Peter? Where were the men? Did Jesus know that men would not believe the message delivered by Mary? And we know they didn't believe. And we know Jesus didn't let him get by with it. Mark 16, 14, Jesus upbraided them for their unbelief. They would not believe the witness of a woman. I've had men say to me, you know, until you came across my life, I wouldn't have listened to a woman preach. I want to tell you a revelation that I had. Preparing for this message, and I want you to write it down, and every time you women preach, mention this. The three cardinal facts of our Christian faith, of Christianity, were all three first witnessed by women. Number one, the Immaculate Conception of Christ. And when this happened to Mary in the first chapter of Luke, what was the first thing she did? She ran to Elizabeth's house, and that's what I call networking. Women's International Network. Mary ran to Elizabeth, held it in her heart. She didn't run to Papa and she didn't run to Joseph. Not until it was too late. Six months. And Elizabeth witnessed to it and the babe leaped in her womb and she received the Holy Ghost. Two witnesses according to the Jewish law. Everything be established in the mouth of two witnesses. Here was Mary. Here was Elizabeth. And now our whole faith hangs on the immaculate conception of Jesus Christ, virgin birth, and it was a woman that testified to it, and the men believe it and preach it. Women, let us believe it and preach it. Yeah. Joseph... God had to let him go to sleep and slip up on him in a dream. <laughs> Surprise, Joseph. <laughs> Mary, you're engaged, you're, you're betrothed. Beyonce is pregnant. <laughs> Come on, you guys. He's just like you. Surprise. You think he woke up after that? I think he woke up, but see, God put it in his heart. But he wasn't in on the first witness, but he cooperated with it. You see this man down here? He's cooperated with me. That takes a pretty good-sized man to do that. But T.L. Osborne is that size man. <laughs> Mary ran to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was another carrier of a special child. And she was the confirming witness. Now, number two. So number one was the Immaculate Conception. That even to this day, we only have the witness of, a women, of women. No man could prove that that really happened. Number two. The crucifixion and all of the events at the cross was only witnessed by women. Four of the seven sayings on the cross 
were only heard by the women. John heard three of them, but after Jesus said, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. John took Mary home. But who was still around the cross? The women were there. So the women never left. And I can document this with the theologians and commentaries that all seven of the sayings were heard by the women. Only three were heard by John and the other men. Where were they? Say it again. Where were the men? It's okay. You can say it right out loud. When you just mark it in your notes to read in the 23rd chapter of Luke and the 19th chapter of John and search it for yourself. You really have to study those to get those seven sayings together. But what my point is, is this. The women witnessed it, and the men believed them, and it got documented in the document. Women, you can be so credible that even the men will believe your witness. And God will confirm your witness. See, Jesus, he waited for his time, and he came and said, Hey, you guys, shame on you for not believing the witness of these women that you know. Okay, the number third, cardinal of the Christian faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from among the dead, the 20th chapter of John. These three cardinals of the Christian faith witnessed by women first. I, my message tonight is women witnesses, world changers. How you doing, Helen? She's just straight from Australia. Are you wide awake? My goodness. The but I have good news. The status of women changed when Jesus came. You know what? Women were in a mess when Jesus came. I showed before this service a video on women in Brazil. Many of you people were there and you witnessed it. But you know, women don't have to stay in prisons anymore. Women don't have to stay hampered anymore. Women don't have to be battered and abused anymore because Jesus has come. But if they don't know that he's come, if they don't hear the good news, if we can't help them break out of their chains, they won't get out of their chains. And the guys have held the torch for a very long time. Am I my brother's keeper is one thing, but am I my sister's keeper is another thing. And yes, women, we are our sister's keeper. Yeah. We can't expect the men to go win all the women in the world. If they win the men, good for them. What about you and me? What about our sisters? That's what this message is all about tonight. When Jesus came, woman was restored to her original status. What was the original status? Just a little lower than God. How does that fit you for size? Just a little lower than God. Woman and man both were elevated when Jesus came. Therefore, it's important that the resurrection was witnessed first by women. Preached first by a woman. Why should we ever lack courage again? If one woman did, can't all women? Thank you. That's very enthusiastic. I can tell you're all just going to go straight out of here and preach the gospel. I want to quickly cover four facts about Mary Magdalene. That's what I was preaching when I got sidetracked on those three cardinals. You try to keep up with me now on these eight facts about Mary Magdalene because we're going to apply them to your life and to my life. She had seven demons. Fact number one. That means completely possessed. Totally. devils she was not a prostitute she was not an immoral woman she was a wealthy woman and according to Bible commentaries like John Haley dr. John Haley she had times of insanity totally possessed of demons it don't matter how restricted how bound how confused how out of touch 
Jesus is here tonight to set you free and to deliver you. I know you're not possessed of demons, but if you're not fully functioning in the body of Christ, you need deliverance. Demons do terrible things to people. They torment people. See, there's probably women right here in this conference tonight that live from one tranquilizer to the next. One shot to the next. See, I've learned that this is in nice people. Suppressed, feeling bound, not free. So they have to suppress it with something that's artificial, a drug. Demons do terrible things. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And honey, I want to tell you, he's not excluding you. If he can steal your identity, if he can kill you physically, and if he can destroy you, your credibility, your witness, your talents, your ability, he's after it. But just like Jesus delivered her, she had seven demons, totally controlled, totally out of control. But he loosed her, set her free, delivered her completely. See, demons torment. They make you captive. See, if you only operate in a little circle and you don't have freedom of expression, you don't have freedom to exercise God's gifts in you, who's to blame? The devil's to blame. But he'll loose you and let you go if you'll cooperate and do as Mary Magdalene did when she encountered Jesus Christ. Devils bring sickness. They bring destruction. They bring deceit. Devils make good people do bad things. They cause shame. They cause disgrace, mistrust, fear, and abuse. You say, well, Dr. Daisy, why are you preaching like this to such a nice conference of Christian women? Because this is a tool that's going to go all over the world, and they're not all Christian out there. I was preaching in Uganda. While I was preaching, I kept hearing something off in the crowd. How many of you believe in devils? Whether you believe in them or not, they're around. But how many of you believe that God's power through Jesus Christ is stronger than all the devils in hell? And I was preaching and I kept hearing this strange noise out in the crowd. It sounded like a dog barking. And I couldn't imagine a crowd so densely packed and this sound of a dog coming from the midst of the multitude. It was a woman possessed of devils. A young woman. Do you know when I prayed that night, the devils came out of her and Betty Ann Deeru was totally delivered in a moment of devils. Now, I didn't know anything about it. You see, the power of God is in his word. And as you preach, it happens. Devils don't stay around where they hear this. They don't like it. She was delivered, and I saw a woman come up, and she was kind of disheveled and had dust and de dead grass in her hair, but she had the most radiant smile. Her eyes were sparkling and those beautiful white teeth like only Africans can show. Smiling with her hands raised and tears running down her cheeks, her story was, during the Ugandan Revolution, soldiers captured her as a young woman, as a teenager, and took her off to the soldiers' camp, and they raped her, and they abused her, and they kept her tied up, and they just used her at will, and she was trapped. There was nothing she could do about it. And she was so angry on the inside that she lost her mind. She went totally bonkers. You and I know it's the devil. That moment when she came under the influence of the gospel, she was delivered. And when she came up, she said, you know what happened to me? I began to love everybody around me. And she said, this was a new experience. I hadn't felt it for all these years. And love, I looked at everybody and I loved them. I liked them. It was wonderful. And she said, I knew that everything was gone. And so what had happened, 
she was wonderfully delivered, wonderfully healed, and she came up and I said, now, what are you going to do now? She said, well, I'm going to go back to my village, and I'm going to go show what's happened to me, because you see, they kept her tied up. She was just like a dog. She stayed on all fours. She barked. She was just a demon-possessed woman, totally possessed. Well, she went back to her village, and LaDonna and I were privileged to go back to Uganda some months later. I had a rally, rallying people who had been miraculously healed, just one big rally, and Betty was there. And she came, and she said, oh, I said, Betty, how are you? Oh, she said, I'm wonderful. She said, I have to tell you the rest of my story. So I went back to my village, and she said, you know, I was engaged when those soldiers took me. And I knew that my fiancé had married somebody else. But she said, you know, he hadn't. He was waiting for me. That isn't done in African culture, especially after somebody has been so used and abused like this. That's, that's non-touchable, spoiled merchandise. Right, Margaret? There he was waiting for her. She gave her witness, and her entire village accepted Jesus Christ. And her fiancé said, will you marry me? And they got married. He's a medical doctor. And he said, now, Betty, I don't want you to work. I don't even want you to stay at home all the time. I want you to preach. Smart man. He said, you go wherever God tells you to go, and you preach, and I'll support your ministry. And Betty was preaching. You see, you don't have to go to seminary for a long, long time. I'm going to get to that later. Thirteen years, Betty had been demon-possessed. I said, Mary Magdalene, one fact, she had seven demons. I don't care how many demons you got. Jesus is greater than all demons, and he destroyed and defeated the devil. Remember around here we said there's only two things you need to know about the devil. One is he's the accuser. Number two is he's defeated. Finished. That's all you need to know. Yeah. Number two, she was delivered from demons. We wouldn't want to leave the story that she was possessed of demons, so had seven demons. The good part of the story is that she was delivered from demons. Why? Because, number one, she met Jesus. And when she met Jesus... You know you can't silence a woman that's met Jesus. That's right. If you're willing to sit in your corner and just nod and agree with everything that's said, check up. You might need to have another encounter with your Jesus. You can't shut up. Now, it's true you don't have to talk in church. You don't have to scream out and take the place of the preacher. But there's a world out there, and that's where the need is. That's where the hearts are. She met Jesus. Her turmoil was turned to peace, her hatred to forgiveness, her fear to confidence, her sickness to health, her shame to honor. Just like Betty and Dew. There was a woman in Uganda another night, Maria Teresa. Dying, laying over on a couch, on a bed, on the ground, just a mat. Totally paralyzed, couldn't walk at all. Her brother had put her in a taxi and they'd gotten her there and laid her out there at the side. And she was, she was just, had given up. She was dying. She wasn't living anymore. She was in such intense pain, she could hardly stand it. Laying out there on the ground. I'm trying to paint a picture, women, of what women are like all over the world. They're out there. They're hurting, they're in need, and you and I have a responsibility to do something about it. Something. Well, she was laying out there, and I was preaching, and I was preaching, woman, be free. And I just made that statement, and she, did, she thought that lightning struck her, and she heard a clap of thunder, and lightning struck her. But she stood up to her feet. She didn't know she was standing up to her feet. And when, she, when that happened to her, she went blind. She stood up, and she put her hands out like this, and she was trying to get up to the platform because she couldn't see. And the preachers and the ushers said, no, she's a crazy woman. Don't pay any attention to her because I was being interrupted in my message, and I was going to let her come. And they said, no, she's just a crazy woman. But the Lord said to T.L., she's not just a crazy woman. Go get her. So he obeyed the Lord. 
him in all of his dignity and his great big African attire walks off that platform and goes down through the crowd and finds her and leads her. She was saying, Dr. Daisy, Dr. Daisy, Dr. Daisy. And he didn't know what was wrong, but he figured if she is saying that, he needed to hook us up. <laughs> and he felt like something really marvelous had happened. She came up and as I touched her, I said, I'm Dr. Daisy. And she put her arms around me, just about squeezed me to death. She put her arms around me, I squeezed her, and her eyes came open like that, and then she looked and realized, hey, I'm healed, I don't have no pain, I'm walking, and she took off. Today, Maria Teresa is a preacher full-time. You see, when you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, you do something about it. Jesus touches your life. He takes your abilities. He takes the good in you, just like he did Mary. He took the good that was in her. He took what was useful. He took what was successful and used it for his glory. That's what he wants to do with your life. You're loaded with ability. You're loaded with talent. Let's go on a world scale. Put you up against the world. You're loaded. You've got so much to give, so much to offer. Don't start offering by going to China. Start offering by going to your community, your neighbors, your condominium, your neighbors, your family. Start where you are and grow yourself to China or wherever it is you want to go. But if you can't prove it where you are, for God's sake, don't try to prove it on some other nation. Well, you could be a lot more enthusiastic than that. Mary became a witness and a world changer. Say, I want to be a witness and a world changer. You see, the bad in us, it doesn't matter what, you come, what package you come to God with, the bad in us is choked out by the good of God that grows in us. So it doesn't matter where you are today, you've only just begun. We have great potential. Women witnesses, world changers. Listen to what John Haley says about Mary Magdalene. He says, and he's a Bible scholar, Mary Magdalene was the leading woman of Jesus' group, one at the head of Jesus' work. She went ahead of him and the other disciples and made preparations. T.L., you know anything about a woman going ahead and making preparations? You remember when Jesus sent them off to get the donkey? He sent two of his disciples. Come on, you remember? Yeah. Who did you always picture that was? Come on, name them. Who were they? Peter and John. Everybody thinks it's Peter and John. Now, can you imagine those two bishops going to get a donkey? You know good and well it was two women that went and got that donkey. Come on, I've been all over the world and I know who gets donkeys. I know who very often is the donkey. Okay, I had num point number one, she had seven demons. Number two, she was delivered from the demons. Number three, she became a follower of Jesus Christ. Everybody say follower. follower. Let me ask you a question. How many leaders can you follow at one time? One. I said what? How many? One. Check up. How many voices can you hear at one time? She became a follower of Jesus Christ. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, that requires your full concentration, your on-purpose cultivation, your diligence, follower, a disciple, a learner. I had a revelation about learning. I shared it with Pastor, with T.L. Don't 
try, write this down, don't try to learn everything before beginning. This is a revelation to me. And it makes life so much easier. Being what you are, teaching what you know, and continuing to study makes such good sense, and that's what God said to T.L. and Daisy when he brought us back to Tulsa. Don't try to learn it all. Witness is such an easy command to obey. Witness is all Jesus said for us to do. Now, all the learning that you can get, the better. Keep learning. But not instead of doing. And I say this to women because many times women feel that they're not capable, not qualified, can't preach in the pulpit. They, they, they feel so inadequate when they hear all of these eloquent men who have been exercised in their skills for centuries and have exercised their little boys since they could quote a scripture and taught the little girls how to be beautiful. Witness is such an easy command to obey. What does it mean? Witness only means I saw something, I heard something, I experienced something. Now, how many degrees do you need for that? I saw something. What did you see? I heard something. What did you hear? I experienced something. What did you experience? That's what Jesus said. Just go tell that. When John's disciples came to Jesus and John inquired, John wanted to know, are you the Messiah? Are you the one we look for or do we, should we wait for another? And Jesus told him, go tell what John what you've seen and what you've heard. Isn't that easy? Tell what you know. But do what Mary did, be stay a follower of Jesus Christ. Number four, she became a partner with Jesus. The first lesson she learned after she started following Jesus Christ was the parable of the sower. Isn't that great? I wonder if we oughtn't to teach that as a class to all new believers. Start right there. Because if your pocketbook is not in it, you're not in it. First lesson she learned was sowing and reaping. She most important lesson was seed planting, seed power. Sowing, reaping, giving, receiving. When I talk about seed, I want to say it's not just money I'm talking about. You have lots of things besides money. You got money, you got time, you got abilities, you've got energies. Where are you seeding them? When are you investing them? And where are you planting them? Because you see, if you plant your energies in the right place, you don't run out of energy. You put your money in the right place, you don't run out of money. You get the message? You are a steward of your talents, your abilities, everything you've got, you're the steward. God trusts you with it. She learned that you don't plant seeds along the wayside to be eaten up by the birds. She learned you don't put it where it's dry. It needs moisture. She learned you don't plant it among the thorns. They'll choke it out. She learned you put it in good ground so it'll bear a hundredfold. Women, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Wherever you put your energies, why don't you turn some of your energies out to other women? Reach other women. 
in addition to everything else you're doing and pretty soon that'll become your focus and when that becomes your focus believe me you can change the world by changing the women we may call the men the traditionalists but it's the women who teaches it to the children she shared and helped support Jesus' ministry. Isn't that interesting? Now, here was God in the flesh, and he didn't even have a golden funnel coming down from heaven to supply all of his needs. No, it was women who had been healed, who had been delivered. They were following him, and they were paying his bills. And you know what? Look back over the hundreds of years of the church. Who has paid the church's bills all of these years? They certainly have. She shared and helped support Jesus' ministry. Yeah, I love this about Jesus. He didn't use magic. He didn't reach up in the sky and pull down all the things that he could have. He used the channels that he knew we were going to need to use. You see, he taught by example as well as by parable. So he taught giving and receiving, sowing and reaping, and it's a cardinal principle of our Christian faith. Women, don't be chinchy with God. Be generous with God, but sow your seed intelligently. If you've got a guy up there telling you to sit down and shut up and submit and go home and be beaten, don't plant your seed there. Mary became totally involved in the ministry of Jesus. How? By being involved with people. Don't worry about a pulpit and a robe and a title. Get totally involved with people as an expression of Jesus Christ in your flesh today that is the greatest ministry anybody can ever have. This other is an aspiration to the hierarchy. But this other is an aspiration to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and to emulate your Lord and Master. She became totally involved with people. The greatest example living today that I know of as an expression of Jesus in our world is Mother Teresa. You see, if you really love God, what do you do? Light a candle once a week? Pay a tithe every time you get a check? Faithfully fill a pew, teach a Sunday school class? If you really love God, there's only one way to show it. Love people. You got money? Money without people is nothing. Has no value. The only value of money is what you can do for people. That's what Mary was showing us. She was helping to support the ministry. I'm not saying you have to give everything to the church, but be stewards of your money. Make it do something that you can see that is going somewhere and it's multiplying a hundredfold. See, I believe women should be financially independent. I'm sorry if you disagree with me. See, my mama had 11 kids, little four foot, 10 inch woman. 11 kids, no conveniences, scrubbed the clothes on a rub board, boiled the water on a stove in the dead of summer. Listen, cooked on a wood stove in the dead of summer in a little house with no air conditioning. She worked from daylight to after dark just in order to make our clothes and cook our food. Sure, all the kids were working too. But we're not living like that anymore. You tell me to go home and be a wife 
and take care of things and all I have to do is push half a dozen buttons and get the kids off to nurse daycare center or to school. What am I going to do the rest of the day? Watch soap operas and take tranquilizers and drink booze? I believe women should cultivate their skills. Women are no longer illiterate. You can read. You can read the most difficult books. And if you can't read Hebrew and Greek, you can study them. There's classes in both languages. If you don't want to do that, you don't have to. But listen, there's a, we've got a long way to go to catch up. Earn money. Put a price on your skill. It's not wrong. It's not sacrilegious. You've got abilities, put a price on it. Then you're going to have some money. Then grow it. There's all kinds of networking enterprises now. Come on, pull off that mask of poverty. You don't need that anymore. All of you women are salespeople, every one of you. Every one of you women have sold a product or more than you're in your life. Most of you have sold a lot of products in your life. That's right. You find a good laxity if you tell everybody about it. A good washing powder, you tell everybody. A new fragrance of cologne, you tell everybody. I mean, we are marketeers. Let's do it on purpose and get something back, some revenue, so we can be rich. Why not? I believe that you can help the world with wealth. We got enough on the poor side. Let's join the other side. Oh, well. That's enough. My point is, Become totally involved with your world. Let Jesus be totally involved through you to people. Grow your money. Use your money. Minister to people. You say, well, I don't have a ministry. I'll give you one. I'll give you a ministry. God is raising up women to witness, to preach, to become wealthy, and to be totally involved in the ministry of Jesus. That is the greatest motivation in the world for achieving skills and gaining wealth and being useful. Number five. I'm heading for it. T.L. told me, he said, give them all you got because you may just get this one shot. And he is a wise man. Number one, she had seven demons. Number two, she was delivered from demons. Number three, she became a follower of Jesus. Number four, she became a partner with Jesus. And number five, Mary was faithful. She was always there. She was not spasmodic. She didn't have roller coaster moods. She was always there. That's important. You see, growth takes place that way. This other, it uproots the taproot all the time, disrupts life, disrupts productivity, disrupts the fruit. It takes the consistency of your life to really grow and make a difference. She left Magdala to follow Jesus. If you leave someplace, be sure that's what your objective is, is to follow Jesus, not to split from Joe. Besides, don't split from Joe. Work with him. Love him. Minister to him. That doesn't mean crawl under his boot. You know the difference. She stayed by Jesus to the end, or was it to a new beginning? You know, when you walk with Jesus, you've got new beginnings just right along. 
She was there at the trial. She was in Pilate's Hall, at Pilate's Hall. She was at Calvary. Are you hearing me, women? She was there when there were accusations. We got a neighbor down the street. Gets accused by the media. But we hang right in there and so do they. And everybody said amen. amen. You know what Dr. Schuler says, when the going gets tough, the tough really get going. And no matter how tough the times, the tough get tougher. She was there at Calvary. She was there at the cross. I mean, these were not pretty pictures that she was going through. There's a whole sermons in every one of these women. I'm, I'm preaching mostly because of you, you, most of you women are leaders. So I'm seeding you with messages. When you go back down and yell to Paris, you're going to just be loaded with stuff. You get up there and wow, send me a tape recording of what you preach when you get back. She was at Calvary when he was wounded, when he was bleeding on the cross. She was there. When he was taken down from the cross, she was there to help prepare his body for burial. Every one of these stages, if I had time tonight, is a message with a contemporary application to our lives, the stages that we go through in following Jesus. There's nothing new about it. But there's one thing. We know what it's like at the end. We come through victorious. We come through stronger than ever, tried like gold and refined. And then she was there at the tomb. Say it. Where? Where were the men? She was at the tomb. And she was at the ascension. I think that's pretty consistent. She was faithful, always there. Stayed with him. Hey, don't be a fair weather Christian. When everything is just hunky-dory, great, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Praise God. No, let's keep the joy, 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 joy. Let's be the generators of the joy, joy, joy. Mary stayed, and I'm going to give you eight things real fast. Number one, Mary stayed when others gave up. They were ashamed. They were disappointed. They felt they had been misled. Number two, when Mary went to the tomb... Even after the angel told her he's not here. Helen, what did she do? She just looked for herself. I mean, she had seen these guys and she had heard these guys. She wasn't going to listen to nobody else. She's going to look for herself. She looked in the tomb, didn't take the word of others, resisted the doubts of others. Refused to be part of the questions of the others. And number three, she prayed. We've had women here praying 24 hours a day. Preparation for this conference. Irene Baker from New Guinea has got 500 women in New Guinea praying 24 hours a day for this conference. <laughs> number four, she listened. You see, when you pray, you don't do all the talking. You do enough talking, but then you do enough listening. You got to get your prayer, your verbalization exercised, but you also got to get your hearing exercised. So you know the voice when you hear it. So you don't have any confusion. She listened, and number five, she heard her own name. You're not going to hear Daisy. You're going to hear your name. You're going to hear Cecilia. You're going to hear Lindsay. You're going to hear Cheryl. You're going to hear Margaret. You're going to hear your name. And he's not going to call you Mrs. So-and-so. <laughs> Number six, she received a personal commission. And I saved this one for TL tonight. 
the first commission before the great commission you know why they call it the great commission because the men were in on that conversation <laughs> she got a private personal first commission before the general commission and number seven she believed when she saw Jesus saw that he was risen she had no more questions women let's move on till we come to the relationship with Jesus Christ where we don't have any more questions yes hunger thirst searching learning experiencing yes questioning never Jesus never and number eight she acted on what she heard she ran with the message didn't add to it didn't take away from it didn't even select anybody went straight as her orders were given straight to the people she's called to and gave it to them oh there's so many sermons in these points and the basis for Mary's faith why she was able to do that is found over here in Luke chapter 18 come on it'll wake you up to turn over there Luke chapter 18 verses 31 to 33 now the King James says I'm reading the New King James that he took the 12 aside and said to them now I'm not sure if he did that or not come on how irreverent can you be I don't know if he took the 12 and had a private conversation but I can guarantee you this by what Mary did she was listening <laughs> the Bible says be, they took then he took the 12 aside and said to them behold we're going up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished for he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon and they will scourge him and put him to death and the third day he will rise again and that was the basis for Mary's faith the Word of God is the only basis for faith in God you can stand on his word you can stand on his promises you can stand on what he tells you because he'll never change his mind it's an anchor for you okay number six she preached Mary announced the resurrection the most basic message of the Christian faith that is the woman witness that equals a world changer and I'm going to read you something out of a book that's called woman be free by Patricia Gundry if women are to be allowed equal pay equal education equal job opportunities and equal voice in the church then someone will have to move over and make room everybody say move over. move over changes will come say that changes will come. now but will those changes be destructive to the church and society or just to the favored positions of those who keep women down now when women struggle to gain the vote it was said that suffrage would destroy order and the family for it would take women out of their place when abolitionists worked for the emancipation of blacks it was said that the black people were unable to contribute to society in any other way than as laborers freeing them would destroy order and trigger degeneracy in society how do you like that Shiana come on instead of the predicted results we have all reaped benefits from the abilities of blacks and women whose contributions would have been lost to us if they had been left to die in southern plantation cotton fields or bounded by kitchens and parlors 
Is there an American who has not benefited from the work of George Washington Carver or a baby born whose parents would erase the work of Dr. Virginia Apgar, whose Apgar score is widely used to evaluate a baby's overall condition within 60 seconds of birth, making it possible to predict and often aid the baby's chances for survival? Florence Nightingale said, I would have given the church my head my hands, my heart. She would not have them. She told me to go back and do crochet in my mother's drawing room. What body can work to full potential in ha if half its members are bound with ropes and blinders so that full motion and vision are impossible? The body which is the church has bound its women in this way. Is there not room for God? Is there not room in God's church for all the members of his body to use everything he's given them? Where are the Florence Nightingales? Where are the Virginia Apgars? Where are the women who will say, I'll be a witness, I'll be a world changer, not to go out and declare revolution or to go out on purpose just to change things, but to just be. Be a witness. Let Jesus witness through you. And number seven, she was at the prayer meeting, and this message is growing. <laughs> but I'm going to give it all to you tonight. I'm going to just brief it. She was at the prayer meeting. What prayer meeting? In Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. The Bible says they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. That's where Jesus had commissioned them. On entering Jerusalem, they went straight to the upstairs room where they had been staying. Now listen, for those men to go straight any place, you know who was leading them. Everybody say it again. Where were the men? They were right in tow. <laughs> After it says that, then they list the 11. They had a roll call. By common consent, this is what the Bible says in the New King James, by common consent, all these men together, with who? With the women. Everybody say, with the women. <laughs> and you know what Pastor T.L. says on that? He says the women were actually having the prayer meeting and invited the guys. <laughs> of course, we know it was at Peter's house. But look, by common consent, all these men together with the women, they got all took a vote and said, is it okay for all of these, how many women, T.L.? Come on, tell me how many. Amen. Is it okay for all of these 109 women to come to this prayer meeting with us guys? I'm, you're slow, but I'm waiting. <laughs> By common consent, all these men, together with the women who had followed Jesus, Mary, his mother, as well as his brothers, devoted themselves to prayer. Women, when you're a witness, prayer is an integral part of it. Otherwise, you're just some more hot air. But the woman who prays, who studies, who listens, who walks in that agape love. Did you know that kind of a woman is irresistible? You don't have to worry about all the social things. Just be that woman. But work at being that woman. So she was at the prayer meeting, and number eight, she was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I got a good one for you here. Acts 2, chapter 1 to 5. Oh. Well, Let's turn over there. I think I better turn over there. You got time? You paid your registration fee. I'm giving you your money's worth. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And then when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound of, from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and filled the whole house. And you know. And they were all, everybody say all, all, filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 5 is what I want to share with you. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, 
And when I read that, I thought I wonder about that. So I called some scholars, William McDonald. He called Dr. Brad Young. I said, I want to know if that word men means man, male. Well, they spent the afternoon researching it. Dr. Brad Young says, you tell Dr. Daisy that she can quote me. First 15 chapters of Acts were originally written in Hebrew. That word that's used there saying men in English in Hebrew means man, woman, both. The transliteration into Greek, the word means man, woman, both. You see, devout people, devout women, devout men. But you see, women get lost. But you know what? If we were there, we can find us. But it takes a woman to find a woman. They're there, they're alive and well, and there are examples. Isn't that good? Devout women and men were there. Now i got to go back. I lost my place. I got carried away. I needed both hands that time. Acts 2, my goodness. They were dwelling in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And they heard what was happening. And Peter stands up and gives the reason for all of this happening. And this is that. Well, if this is that and I got that, how can I sit down and shut up? Women witnesses are world changers when they have been touched by Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit. And your witness will make a difference. It will change your world and the world. Jesus brought a new day, a new birth, a new life, new hope, new purpose. No longer were we slaves or bound or held back or limited. We're redeemed. We're restored. We're empowered. The new church is born. Women witnesses have changed the world. Women, let's not let down the four mothers while keeping the faith of our fathers. There'd be no fathers if there hadn't been mothers. Now, you and I are the voices that the world's waiting to hear. You and I don't make up a silent majority. God help us. You got a voice? Speak up. You got an opinion? State it. You got a yearning, a desire? Do it. I'm not talking in the worldly sense. I'm talking about in the godly sense. When God puts something in your heart and tells you to do it, do it. Don't go ask the theologians if it's okay. Oh, you noticed I'm a woman. Are you sure it's all right? Don't ask them. You know, pretty soon they'll just accept you like they are and they'll say of you like they say of me, I'm just a rare exception. I'm not a rare exception. I'm just normal. I'm what every woman should be. The good thing that happened to me was I never knew I shouldn't. Thank God. He picked me up as a 17-year-old, put me in the arms of an 18-year-old and spun us to the world. And I came back as a grandmother. It's true. We have a voice. We have a choice. Choose who you will serve. Choose who you will follow. Choose who you will obey. Choose who you will love. Choose who your teacher will be. Let it be Jesus. I don't want to assume that everybody in this audience tonight is already a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to give opportunity for you, if you're not right with God, to get right with God. I'd like for every head to be bowed and every eye closed, please. I believe that the Spirit of God is moving here 
in hearts and lives, and I would like to request, please, that there be no moving around. Decisions of a lifetime are being made tonight. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I want to turn my attention to you that are watching by video. You've heard this message tonight. Now the decision is yours. Make the choice. Choose Jesus Christ, the great liberator. He'll set you free from everything. Believe him right now. Everybody believe with me as I pray for the video audience. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see every person that's watching by video or listening by cassette. And in the name of Jesus Christ, minister to every individual. In the name of Jesus, I loose you from the bondage of Satan. You are set free now by the power of God in the name of Jesus as you believe. God bless you. Rejoice and love Jesus.